You see, we've been talking about the inner life of the human uh, being. We've talked about how we have at least four different faculties guiding and motivating us within ourselves. Now, the first three of those faculties are part of who we are as earthly creatures. The instinct, the emotions, and the intellect. Those three parts of us are grounded in biology. They can be affected by biology, whether we're talking about disease, genetics, hormones, or brain chemistry. They are what the Apostle Paul called the flesh. But as we've established, there is a fourth human capacity, a spiritual one that is not influenced by biology. We call it the conscience. The conscience is a gift of God's Holy Spirit. It's through the conscience that the Holy Spirit speaks to us. The life of faith, the one that we all pursue, is a life of learning to hear the Spirit and of disciplining ourselves to obey the Spirit's voice. Unfortunately, our more fleshly capacities can be very loud. They can be very noisy, so noisy, in fact, that they can make the Spirit's voice difficult to hear. You see, these fleshly capacities are motivated by natural God-given desires. They're not evil, they're not wrong, but they have to be kept in check. They have to be tamed. Because when we let those desires run wild, the results are profoundly destructive. Most notably, unchecked fleshly desires can prove harmful to our relationships with others. You see, God made us to live in relationship. We have an innate relationship to God as our creator, our sustainer, our savior. We're born with a basic instinctive relationship with our family, or at least with our mothers, and we develop relationships with those among whom we grow up, the family who raises us, the neighbors who are prominent in our lives. We have some degree of relationship with every human being we come in contact with, and often even with animals. How many of you have a pet that you have a strong bond with? Yeah. It's who God made us to be. God made us to be in relationship. Now, the nature and quality of those relationships vary. Some of those relationships are healthy, some are broken, and most are a blend of healthiness and brokenness. Most relational brokenness can be traced back to unchecked human desires. Desires that were not properly subjected to the moral guidance of the spirit through the conscience. Our instinct, for example, desires those things that help us survive both as individuals and as species. Not something that's evil or bad in and of itself. When we're hungry, we desire food. When we're thirsty, we desire something to drink. When we're tired, we desire rest. When we're in pain, we desire relief. When we're amorous, we desire satisfaction. But what? I expected at least a chuckle on that one. Yeah, But what happens when we perceive that there isn't enough to go around to meet those desires? What happens when we don't think there is enough food or water to go around? Well, it leads to conflict. It leads to competition. It leads to aggression. In fact, anthropologists and historians believe that the very first wars broke out over competitions over re resources. What about that desire for rest? How does that lead to conflict? Well, when people are deprived of rest, let's get this straight first. When people are deprived of rest and sufficient sleep, the results are devastating to their physical and mental health. And I've got to say that in today's society, I tend to think that people are more frequently overworked than underworked. That said, rest often brings us a great deal more pleasure than the exertion of work. So sometimes we can choose to rest when we should be attending to crucially important tasks. Medieval Christians called that sloth. We tend to call it laziness. Laziness can leave crucial tasks undone. It can create unnecessary burdens for other people who probably have their own burdens they're already carrying. As for the reproductive impulse, we all know what happens when two guys are interested in the same girl or two girls in the same guy. It can get ugly. 
And we all know that an untamed libido can do a lot more damage than that. Some of the darkest atrocities human beings can commit arise out of an untamed reproductive impulse. Our emotional impulses seek satisfaction in their own way too. Anger, for instance, seeks out justice. It seeks out revenge. Anger is satisfied when the, only when the offending party somehow feels the pain of the offense. At the very least, anger desires that the offender feel the emotional weight of the offense and apologize. Sometimes, however, anger drives a person to inflict the same harm on the offender. To have vengeance, to retaliate, an eye for an eye. But those impulses don't lead us into anything helpful. Unfortunately, sometimes offenders are incapable of fully understanding how they've offended us. And that can make their apologies seem unsatisfactorily insincere. Vengeance creates a never-ending cycle of harm. That's why Jesus explicitly taught against retaliation. Fear is satisfied when the person experiencing the fear feels safe, safe from physical harm, safe from discomfort, safe from social awkwardness, safe from rejection. But sometimes things that, re that are necessary require facing danger. Sometimes things that are necessary require facing discomfort, social awkwardness, and potential rejection. Sometimes the greater good for us and for others requires us to overcome fear. Now, sadness is satisfied by its opposite, happiness. But sometimes happiness isn't available to raise our spirits and life requires us to move forward despite our sadness. Finally, happiness is in itself satisfaction. It is by definition satisfaction. But even happiness is temporary and situation based. The simple fact is we will not and cannot always be happy. Sometimes in our eagerness to maintain our happy feelings, we can avoid situations that might potentially make us feel mad, sad, or afraid. Situations that we shouldn't be avoiding because we are morally compelled to enter into them. So our instincts and our emotions can seriously mislead us in our relationships with others. They can lead us into conflict. Now, ideally, our intellect has the power to keep our base or impulses at bay. But if our feelings are strong enough, the intellect can buckle under the pressure and rationalize giving in to our instincts and emotions. Of course, the intellect has its own motivations. The intellect is curious. The intellect always wants something new, some interesting stimulation. The lack of the interesting leads to boredom. That's why we're drawn to the flashy and the new. That's why we get bored with the same old thing. Unfortunately, though, sometimes the things that require our attention the most are not the most interesting or stimulating. The intellect also prefers order to chaos. The intellect wants to make systematic sense of the world. Ambiguity and uncertainty are uncomfortable, even offensive to the intellect. Unfortunately, the world is very rarely black and white. The world is mostly shades of gray. Ambiguity and uncertainty are facts of life, regardless of how much we want our worldviews to be solid and certain. Our love of certainty drives us to understand the world the best we can, and that's great. That's what's good about that impulse. But it can also make us rigid, unadaptable, unteachable. Often when someone or something calls into question our understanding of the world, we often respond with fear and even anger. We've already talked about how destructive those emotions can be to relationships. Every human being is filled with desires from the instinctive level all the way up to the higher thinking of the intellect. Out of control, those desires clash with the desires of others and relationships are disrupted. That's where conflict comes from. In this fallen world, none of us have total control over our baser impulses. So conflict in human relationships is inevitable. 
Feelings get hurt. Pride gets stomped on. Words and actions get misinterpreted and misunderstood. When imperfect and broken people try to relate to one another, those relationships will be imperfect and broken. Fortunately for us, our God is a God of reconciliation. Our God is a God of peace. Peace is something that, according to Paul, the Holy Spirit plants and nurtures within us like a gardener carefully tending grapes in a vineyard. That's why peace is listed as one of the so-called fruits of the Spirit. Now, we might be tempted to conclude that the peace Paul is describing here is an inner peace, uh, tranquility, the kind that he mentions in Philippians when he writes, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Now, certainly the Spirit does give that kind of peace, but I think that the sort of peace uh, that Paul is talking about, the, the fruit of the Spirit he lists, is more likely an interpersonal peace. It's peace in our relationships. In this fruit of the Spirit passage, he mainly has righteous behavior in view. And Paul spoke more frequently about interpersonal peace than about inner peace. Consider, for instance, 1 Corinthians 7.15, the last sentence in that verse, God has called us to live in peace. Then this one from 2 Corinthians, finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice, strive for full restoration, encourage one another, be of one mind, live in peace. In Ephesians, Paul talks about how Jesus made peace between Jews and Gentiles, writing, for he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace. Along similar lines, he wrote about working for peace within the church, within the community of faith. Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body, you were called to peace. And then here's my personal favorite from Romans. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Cultivate peace peace with everyone. Work for peace with everyone. Now, you aren't responsible for the actions of others, but you are responsible for the role that you play in conflict. Do you feed it and keep it going? Do you ignore it and hope it'll go away? Now, just to clarify, there's certainly no sense in throwing pearls before swine and making yourself constantly emotionally vulnerable to someone who refuses to reconcile. But even then, you can still relinquish whatever hostility you are holding on to for the other person. Of course, that's easier said than done, and that's why we need the Spirit's help. That's why peace is a fruit of the Spirit. When our impulses and desires put us in conflict with the impulses and desires of others, the Spirit speaks peace into our hearts. The Spirit tells us to hit the brakes and look at the bigger picture. The Spirit reminds us that as Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. When we are in conflict over tangible needs like food and drink, the Spirit teaches us to share what we have with those in need, even if that means our portion is smaller. When we desire to sate our sexual appetites in ways that victimize or violate promises, the Spirit reminds us that all people are worthy of respect and dignity, as is the sacred life-giving gift of human sexuality. When we are in conflict that threatens our comfort, the Spirit reminds us that the well-being of others matters a lot more than our comfort. 
When our anger desires justice, the Spirit reminds us that vengeance is God's and God's alone, and that His justice was carried out on an innocent party named Jesus, who willingly took upon Himself a punishment He didn't deserve. A man who prayed for those torturing Him, saying, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. When we are in conflict over what we fear we will lose, the Spirit reminds us that nothing this world takes away from us is lost forever. Our task is to love faithfully no matter the cost and no matter what we fear losing. When our happiness eclipses and makes us ignorant of the needs and desires of others, the Spirit reminds us that such happiness is fleeting and that it is better to give than to receive. When our minds gravitate towards that which interests us rather than that which interests others, the Spirit gives us the mind of Christ, a mind that values what God values, namely the well-being of other people. Left to their own desires, left to their own devices, our fleshly capacities lead us into conflict. But the Spirit of God has the power to make us into peacemakers. May we not be overcome by the flesh, but may we rather live submitted to the Spirit of peace.